I am not yet uh, allowed to start, right? I'm pretty sure you can start now. Okay, great. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I was, I didn't know if I can or not. Okay. So if so, without further ado, uh, let's uh, start this debate in five, four, three, two, one, go. Panel on our side, two cases. A, why uh, uh, why right-wing uh, students will be disenfranchised and why it will directly harm them. And secondly, why students from those protected minorities will often feel disenfranchised and, and as if their, their agency is taken away from them. But let's start with framing of this debate. A, let's talk about universities. What even types of rules are we uh, talking about? We're talking about basically not offending anybody. Protecting certain groups, especially minority groups, to a very significant extent. This is not just saying, oh, don't be racist. This is saying those are like the things that you're bound to save like very many instances. Ter thirdly, we believe that this is at the end of the day, uh, enforced very strongly, this is talked down upon the students, the students are very well notified that they can't do certain things, that they will be expelled, what are the rules, etc, etc. Note that in both cases, hate speech harassment is illegal. If somebody threatens someone with, with death or like anything like that, they still are expelled, they are still like prosecuted by the criminal law. This is not a case in this debate, and like both sides can basically argue about things like that. that. Let's talk a bit about universities. Notice that universities are places where you have a lot of freedom. Mm -hmm. You can choose your flatmates, you can choose your roommates in dorms, you can choose your courses, you can choose with who do you talk. It's not primary school. Students have a lot of mobility and a lot of freedom in them. It's not as if you're, for example, tied to a certain class, if a professor is bad, you can simply drop, drop it, which will be important later. Okay, let's talk uh, about administrations and universities. And like universities. Notice that the people who are running, especially like the biggest universities, are, are often very liberal, uh, leading to potential like abuses or like this policy being even more strict than it should be. Three reasons to that. A, because we believe this is often like a very closed loop. Often liberal people like elect liberal people into uh, positions of power. Secondly, the vast majority of people on such campuses are liberal by thus basically uh, creating something like this. And thirdly, we believe that people who are more center and right wing are scared of by, for example, how liberal those universities are, which leads to like the majority of people in the positions of power holding liberal views, very liberal views, and then being especially aggressive with those policies. Notice that there are many situations where this policy can be misused or at least aggressive. We can, for example, have situations where we ban right-wing speakers because of what they said, like we can buy Ben Shapiro or something. Secondly, we can throw students out if they do something that is bad. So we can, for example, ban a student if they uh, for, they do a trigger warning, especially like, like this policy. We believe this is a very aggressive reaction to something that is not, I mean, that is harmful, but not that harmful to ban them. Or like we can fire people like distinguished faculty, as we have seen in many cases, who are like not very liberal or like said something that the majority of the people don't agree with or like have much more writing views. Why do we believe that right-wing students feel disenfranchised because of that? And why do they feel attacked by the liberal institutions? Five reasons for that. A, we believe that the, the right, the, 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 this policy is very aggressive. Look, you are threatening them with expelling them. You are talking about how hard, you know you're talking about like how extreme this policy is. Why, when? You are talking about like very very woke values that don't often align with them. We believe that how this aggressive this policy is specifically structured and how like how like precise it is and like in how many cases you can actually use it makes it seem very aggressive. I'll take the POI. So when Zach came to university, he was a Tory and he got bullied anyway, despite the fact that we don't have any safetyism proportions in Aberystwyth. Tories are going to get bullied on either side of this debate. I'm unclear of why ring right why right wing students opt out. Great, but they won't be bullied by the administration. I'll explain the exclusive impacts from that later. Okay, secondly, we believe that the rise in this policy is aggressive. Note that we had a status quo. It's not like this policy is there forever. This policy has risen during like the last five or 10 years. We believe it's a break from the status quo where you couldn't maybe offend anybody, but you could speak your mind. There was a certain consensus on what is acceptable or not. Now that this aggressive policy is even pushed upon you. Thirdly, we believe that that the very group that pushes it, uh, pushes it down upon you is perceived as very aggressive and liberal. As I have told you, the administrative, the, the people who are like running this university are probably rich, very left wing, and then you feel attacked by specifically this group. Fourthly, we believe that at the end of the day, you'll have like a lot of media attacks from right wing organizations that are like center media organizations that th those people may follow because of like the rise in policies. Those people will hear that, and then it will amplify basically the feeling of uh, of like being attacked. And fifthly, in case of misuse in cases of, for example banning the politicians their support it will be much much harsher panel but on the comparative look it's much less political they don't hear as much aggressive from the universities themselves secondly we believe that there is a center, certain kind of status quo everybody accepts they feel safe they feel accepted by the university even if it's liberal they think as if they have an agreement and don't have to fear the impacts of that are huge a 
we believe many people are simply likely to drop out of this uh, of the like educational system. Note this is literally threatening them with exp expulsion. Notice that you that you feel not like your classmates, but the people who run your universities. This is a huge impact for your well-being, but also for for like how you are how are, like likely to be in institutions. But also know that you're losing this course. You're losing the chance of learning because of like right wing people quitting, especially from like the elite liberal universities. Let's talk about liberal people and disenfranchisement. Why this is a disenfranchising policy for them? Three points on that. A, we believe that it feels as if a rise and overprotection. Notice that you are, you, you are not asking even often for his policy. There's some kind of rich white guy who is trying to be woke, who is pushing down upon you very heavy rules and pushing down upon other students. You feel as if basically he's trying to take care of you and he's basically not even asking you for it. You are simply thinking that, oh, this is somebody who is trying to basically take care of, like basically do more steps than are needed, especially how aggressive this policy is. You probably don't want like other students banned. You probably just want to live your own peaceful life. But notice that on the comparative, you can simply live your own life. Notice that you are not probably as harmed on the comparative because A, most people are still liberal as a or like CEO claim on the, the universities. Secondly, most people are not dicks and for example, won't be homophobic to your face if you're a gay. Thirdly, you can choose your friends, you can choose your dorms, you can drop the class if a professor is bad. At the end of the day, this policy is a huge misuse and simply, simply you know that you can live your daily life with kind of peace without this aggressive policy pushed down upon you. But secondly, we believe that you feel as if you are an average student. You feel as if the administration simply sets out the playing rules of what is acceptable. That it basically says, oh, hate is not okay, but it sets the level playing field for everybody. And you feel as if you are treated as every other student by the university, which is especially important for minority groups. Minority groups for years have been treated differently. And for years, they basically, the end goal of most like movements and most people is just to be treated equally and just to be appreciated for who they are and not feeling as they need extra protection. On our side of the house, the agency, uh, on their side of the house, this agency is taken away from them. They are treated completely differently. They, are, they feel as if they are, they, are, they are trapped. But also notice, they fear, for example, for like more right-wing attacks, because as our first case has said, more right-wing people will be basically angered. So this means that they are more likely, for example, to engage, like to be aggressive, to en engage much more emotionally, which also sets out like many more instances, for example, on social media or like outside of campus for those people to be attacked for for who they are, while on the comparative, those people can simply live their daily lives with feeling of being accepted by the university and treated as every student without being harassed. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Prime Minister. Um, Leader of Opposition, you're here. Hi, uh, am I audible? I imagine. Yes. Thank you. The boundaries between immorality and law are very, very blurry. OG wants to say victims of sexual harassment are likely to report to police and their, their uh, like accusers and that stuff is going to go to prison. We say that very, very, very few of these cases are either illegal or they get reported in the first place. Safetyism allows for victims to come out and be able to be protected. We couldn't be, be more proud to be opening opposition. In, we're going to do three things. We're going to provide one framing on why this is necessary to happen, why this is likely to happen in a good way, and why people are dicks in generally. And secondly, why we're deterring harassment and creating better identity for students. Okay. Firstly, why will this be done in a good way? I think we have three reasons for this. One, professors are mostly like liberal, either they have to do liberal arts, psychology, that stuff. Maybe they're even in STEM, but they have friends in other stuff. We say that these people are likely, like, you know, very educated on many of these subjects. Therefore, they're likely to want to do this in a good way. Secondly, you, there is a direct incentive to provide diverse education. This is because you want students to get as many stimuli as possible. This means that you're likely to allow different people to interact with different with, with different other people without directly limiting their interactions. But thirdly, I think people are smart and they scale punishment. This means if somebody does something bad, they won't be kicked out of university immediately. You will say, that was a bad thing. Don't do it again. If they do it again, then you will punish them more up until the point where they need to be kicked out. Why then this need to happen in universities? I think that people want to pretend like adults, but they're not. One, people who enter universities just have left like a context of high school where they just got their first relationships. They were in the same closed circle. Now you have to interact with different people you don't know and different norms. But secondly, notice that you enter 
potentially different people with different, from different classes, from different sexual orientations. Maybe you never had contact with them. It is likely that university is the first place you have contact with, and therefore it needs to be monitored for things to not go bad. Why are people likely dicks? I think three reasons. One, you are not necessarily liberal. The US and UK are very liberal, but some universities in the UK and the US, most universities are not. And most people outside the UK and the US are not liberal. I don't think people will be okay with coming out as gay in a Greek university campus. Secondly, I think you lack education. This is because most primary schools and high schools don't directly teach you that shit. Therefore, you need to be taught at some point. But thirdly, some people are just dicks. Sorry. Okay. First claim, you deter harassment because of gray areas. Why are things that, why are bad things generally not important to authorities? I have three reasons for this. One, I think trust authorities, specifically for minority backgrounds, who usually get violated by authorities like the police, that therefore you don't trust that much to report in the first place. Secondly, proximity, they're far away from the campus. You're uncertain if you, if you know them or you have any personal connection to them to report. But thirdly, there are gray areas. Even if you report sexual harassment, it is very hard for you to have evidence. It is very hard for you to, like, maybe it was not harassment, maybe it was something else. It is very hard for you to be legally standing. Therefore, many of these things don't get reported. Why victims are more likely to report under safetyism? I think two reasons. One, you have at least proximity to your professor. This means it is easier to report to that professor that something bad happened. And secondly, you feel more likely that you're able to report because of the safety and the safe space that are created in campus, because the campus directly encourages you to do so. Therefore, they tell you that your idea of what sexual harassment happened most likely should be reported and we will consider this. Why this harassment is likely to happen? I think three reasons. One, safe spaces means that you can distance yourself from people you find threatening. This means then that less situations of Threat, less threats happen to you directly. I think, secondly, people who do bad things are able to learn from them because they're not necessarily dicks like in a biological sense. This means then that they're more likely to, to understand when, whether they said something was bad, whether they did, did, did something inappropriate, therefore change. But I think, thirdly, people who are really dicks are likely going to be deterred from you know being kicked out of university or seeing other people like losing class. Why is important? Two reasons. One, we prevent sexual harassment or at least minimize it in university campuses where it happens most because it is the most uneducated part of society due to experience. I think this is very important because this directly harms your identity for years and years to come. These are experiences that are very traumatic. Even if we minimize some of them, we still win over pissing off right wingers. But secondly, I think in generally victims being able to come out, even if they're not like, even if something bad did not happen to them, they're better able to rationalize and therefore go ahead and understand the situation better and move on with your life. I will take one from CG now. No, or I don't think that given social communities exist at all points of time, why would the victims not find comfort through student unions and safe spaces created on a social level? Why do you need ah, So you want to do like a weird anarchism case about uh, university students doing this. I think university students do not have the experience nor the expertise of professors and they're not counselors. Therefore, all of the things will happen in a very worse way. They're much more likely to be in a bubble that creates problematic ideas. You need the institution to do it in the first place because they're more experienced. Okay, second claim, identity is strengthened because of safety. Why do you feel better about your identity? I think two reasons. One, the university itself tells you that whatever your identity is, it is accepted so long as you don't harass others. I think at that point, you feel better about yourself because it is one of the first times in your life that probably somebody has said this to you. Point out that most cases are not the US and UK. I think also, secondly, the point you see other people being able to come out as gay or trans and they are not getting harassed or if they get harassed, people are getting punished for it. You feel better about coming out potentially because you feel like it's a less threatening environment. Why? Your identity is at risk when you come out, when there is no safety. I think two reasons. One. Status quo for most countries is not that liberal. This means that you coming out in this particular situation might mean professors lowering your grades because they might not trust you, because they might find you weird. I think this happens in many cases in many countries. Safetyism provides a proper, like, a proper network for the, those professors either to like be consulted by other professors to not do that. But secondly, I think it means that you at least feel like that will happen. Therefore, you're better able to come out based on this. Okay. 
Why identity creates better education and why identity is extremely important? I think one, safety in itself means that you're able to focus more on the lesson without like internalizing hatred from other students. But I think secondly, identity is the means in which you portray yourself to the world. The more that you feel secure in it, the more secure you are in other choices you make. Therefore, we think it is vastly important to be protected for all of the above reasons. Oh, oh. Thank you, Leader of Opposition, for that fine speech. Welcoming Deputy Prime Minister here, here. All right, POI is in the chat, but see you, I see you. I will ask for you at some point. Okay. Three, two, one. It's not always what you actually do in reality, but how you are capable to frame which narrative will be more persuasive. And I want to engage with opening opposition by running a principal case, how we are shifting the victimhood or adding the additional victims to the equation by this particular policy. The framing to this is that you have a lot of people who are right wing, who are already pissed on the liberal bubbles which university are creating. And they're kind of trending right now, right? In particular, because this is unprecedented what the safety policy is doing. There is not something like this to the extent in the workplaces. There is not something like this exists in the preschool. There's not something like this existing in the political discourse. And there are a lot of people who are opposing this particular narrative. And I think people can be very persuasive, can very easily mock the reasons for which they are being kicking out. Similarly, as now we have a massive discourse about the guy who said on his graduation speech that women should be happy to be wives. This is okay, like horrible to hear for the feminist, but this is a freedom of speech. This is his opinion. This wasn't nothing extremely shameful about this, but you are able to flip and show how, how self-critical the liberal bubble is and how hypocritical to that extent. Therefore, let's talk about these people who are making this non-criminal behavior. When you are in the school, the education system, it's quite well to educate you what kind of punishment you will get if you will steal something, if you will punch someone, if you will kill someone, you know the law, right? But this soft skill education about what is norm societally acceptable, it's not very well developed in your preschool, in your family circle, specifically if you are coming from more rural areas, from more conservative families, from people who are not entering the liberal bubbles, who have more right wing view, right? A, you have little control over your surrounding, over your access to education, over your access to different people. So you not always know what is acceptable to say. You are not always know how to behave in front of these people. Second of all, uh, in the pre-university education, you don't have very extensive knowledge how to talk with the other minorities, how to approach different ethnic groups or like different sexualities, right? This is usually something which you are getting from TV shows, from the media, which, which usually teachers have a problem to talk as a taboo. Therefore, I think you are excluding the people who are not ready with the level which the state and the society gave them, which are quite vulnerable, and you are disproportionately punishing them and excluding. Why this is the case? Because you as the administration of the university, the place which should broaden your horizons, the place which should prepare you to being the adult, the place which should give you the knowledge exchange, which should show you the collaboration with the students, are telling you that if you will make one mistake or if you go a little bit too far or if you will approach this group of people who are from the minority, who are not very familiar to you, but if you will say something wrong, you might get a harsh punishment. It Or you are saying this space is not achievable for you because you are bad initially because I saw your on Facebook, or maybe you are coming from the group which is more right-wing, you feel extremely excluded. You have no agency in order to change this because you feel that you have no chance for rehabilitation. They gave you zero mechanism of rehabilitation that you will do better. And I think uh, Paragis went for a very soft case. Paragis, it's like, oh, we will not kick you out. We will just tell you, act better. But if I'm hearing this from my colleagues, they're being supported by the administration, but then I'm hearing from my friends, from my parents at home, or like from the media, which I'm consuming, that this is some crazy shit, that this is illegitimate, that this is someone taking away my freedom of speech, that this is someone tackling and like universities going completely into the shithole to talk about the values and not bringing you 
more education. I'm more likely to be secluded. I'm more likely to form my own group on the university, to not interact with professors or people who tend to be more liberal. I'm Googling them. I'm checking what their views, if they are supporting LGBT community, if they are supporting minorities. I do not want to risk. I do not want to interact them. So you are pushing away the potential integration, which might happen at the universities because you prevent people from fear of exclusion and from being perceived as these bad ones. But what is the outcome of this is that you let these people to claim that they are the victims, that they are the victims of the horrible system, that they are not, they didn't do anything wrong, nothing criminally liable. You can't call police on them. You literally can't shade them anywhere else. But at this university, they were treated like shit and humiliated by this particular policy. The impact of this is A, that people are less likely to integrate within the university with the different group, more likely to seclude themselves, B, more likely to be aggressive or emotional towards the responses outside of the campus when all of these policies are not directly protecting you and you don't feel the safety anymore, which means that the impact for the people who are from this liberal, who are being protected by white saviors because you are such a flag that you need such a strong protection because you can't say a word to this person because they don't know how to protect themselves. They need a massive protection from the state you antagonizing these people, make them more aggressive towards them and less likely to understand what's actually happening in their identity, less likely to integrate. Therefore, I don't believe that this temporary relief, which OP can guarantee you at best with one particular individual at the time, because the other people which you will be meeting later in your workplace or outside the campus or in the internet, which will be shitting on you, that you will learn how to do the self-defense. You will be relying on the mechanisms which are only temporarily, and therefore you will be harder prepared for the long term for your lifetime, which is significantly more severe impact than not opening opposition. It's trying to pose on you. Before I move on, CEO. Frequently, do you think people are using these policies? I do think that on your side of the house, if you're supporting them and you're supporting the current momentum, which is shifting in favor of using it more and more, we want to decline this. We are opposing, we think that it's bringing harms. And yes, I think it will be used more and more specifically if you believe in the framing of opening opposition, that we are talking about sexual harassment, which I think it's bullshit because A, if you do not believe that you can bring this thing to the court and that the person can be properly punished because you as the student university administration are unlikely to collaborate with the police because they will be like, oh my God, they have some crazy policies. They bringing us the people who they have maybe suspicion. This is not a criminal act. What I should do? You are not seeing the end of the procedure. You are not seeing that the person will be actually actually punished. Therefore, it's unclear for me what's the positive impact. But the external impact as well on the university is that all of the right wing people, the politicians or like the parties are unlikely to support the universities or, or uh, actively attacking them as the place to getting the knowledge that they are shifting into the one part of the, the, of the society, that they are not looking for the interest of the majority of the people or like the central people, that they are no longer prioritizing giving you the knowledge, investing in research. Instead, they are investing in some woke policies, which are not giving you tangible benefits for the society. It's very easy to sell this narrative of antagonism, which means that people are less likely to see at the universities. But most importantly, panel, we don't want to add more victims. We think that the situation of the current victims is getting worse on their side of the house on all of the metrics opening government. Great. I thank DPM for that fine speech, welcoming the deputy leader of opposition to respond here, here. Hi, am I clearly audible? Yeah. Great. Give me a second. Time my speech. In three, two, one. I think the idea of opening government that if you poke the bear, the consequences would be devastating is really problematic on opening government. And I think we disagree on that. If you have a bear, and if you have people that, that, want to, want, that don't want to be around the bear, you should probably cage the bear, deter the bear, and have the capacity to actually maximize emotional safety. Really proud to oppose. I'm really sorry for any trigger warnings. I should have said that in the beginning. Three responses to opening government. The first thing they say in the PM, right? And I think like this has to be on the panel. I think they have to pick and choose if the status quo they live and the majority of universities are liberal or not. 
if the case of liberalism exists in the majority of you know the narrative of administration and teachers and the most of the society of, of the university students are liberal i think then the aggression and the backlash towards the principle of you know this is you know very interventionist when it comes to the agents that people have is not as realistic for two reasons one people that are woke and liberal per open government and per pm Con uh, characterization are willing to trade off some benefits they have and some rights they have because they want to pay attention on the request that people have. They can rationalize the vulnerability you have, the susceptibility you have to your identity when it comes to different things affecting you, and therefore they're more likely to, to be okay to not say stuff or to ask for your gender pronouns before they approach you. I think this is very fair to say that people that are liberal are willing to abide by this law. Then the second thing they say is that people are, are people are not dicks and that they won't attack you in your face. They're not homophobic. If that's the case, again, I think that people are willing to abide the law, which is something inherently good. For the case of people that you actually have some dicks in the corner, you actually have one or two that can be enough to cause little devastating and irreversible harm, emotional harm to people. I think this is the case where we apply. We think you should, A, keep these people in check, deter them from saying something bad, feel the consequences of accountability because actions have consequences and they should be, about, they should be aware of that. Second response, responding also to the POIFCG. This has to be organized and centralized. If you allow this to unions, the organic solution of this is, is fucking dangerous. Why? Because the form of you know, resolving this tension is mouth to mouth. You said this, I said this. It is uncertain who is right, if, if it is entirely offensive or not, because of the gray, area, gray areas of framing. This means that authority is required. This means that clear guidelines is required. This means that people are actually having the authority to actually establish, you know, what is right or wrong are required. But the second response, I think, is the beacon of protection is, is, is really signer on outside the house. The moment that you have somebody that you look up to is the moment that you actually feel better about yourself. You feel more protected. You feel someone is around your corner when you feel emotionally devastated. The third response we have to closing government is that we co-op union, unions, right? The moment you have a centralized approach of safety is the moment that you, it is more likely you're going to have organic, organic, you know, things that are happening in unions. So it is more likely to have a more quantitative unions, but then be better organized and better clean capacity to actually be effective. The third response we have to open in government is they say, oh, people will drop out of college because they feel too offend offended. I think this is bullshit. You have other proximity to stay in college. But then they say you will take it in the streets. A, if you take it in the streets, I assume the framing of illegality is way harsher on them because if you retaliate them in on, on more outside the university, then the capacity of this debate and the scope of this debate cannot do anything about it. Presumably, some universities can also, like, you know, in the retrospect, report on universities. And if you have actual capacity to prove stuff, they can actually retaliate students, even if it's not in, in, within the campus. In some occasions, in some not, then you allow the police to do that. But let's take the best case scenario of opening government. Even if you have been retaliated, why you still should report? Two reasons. A. In case you're reporting, you feel that you're, you're gaining back control. It means that you're not losing control. You don't feel that you passively accept this behavior, but you feel you're doing something about yourself. You empower yourself because you feel that you have pointed out and you have signaled that this is fucked up. People misgendering me, people laughing at me about my clothes and my nails and the way that I see my sexuality and the way I see my, myself and stuff like that. The second is because I think this is a role model and this is amplifying, right? The moment I do a report and I do a fuzz about it and I point a figure to a dick that is misgendering me, is the moment that someone else that is actually having emotional harm is the one that actually gets hope that someone is standing for them. The third case of opening government then is, oh, people from rural areas are too ignorant. So this is illegitimate and unfair. I think Panagis already preempted this because, A, we, we explain why you have specific guidelines, specific educational purposes. You have seminars in open roads. You have unions. You have people that you can ask what is allowed to say or not because you're afraid, which means that you're, you're passively getting more educated. But second response, I think the punishment is, you know, appropriate and symmetric to intentions. If I mis misgender someone and then I say, I'm really, truly sorry, I didn't, I didn't want to do this, the punishment won't be as hard. So if this is a case-by-case -case scenario, an accident, you know, the punishment is not as harsh as it, is, as it seems. The last case of opening government then is, oh, you know, this is very, very, very overprotecting and you, you're going to be shocked when you go outside the world. 
A, this is not the real case, right? Because you also have interaction with people outside the university. So this kind of, you know, shocking effect is not as big because you also walk outside of university. I think then from the scope of harm, if we deter you and we make you feel safe in the place that you're shaping your character, A, you're exploring your own, your own, you know, guidance and your own metrics and your own sexuality is something on the Delta more beneficial. If you're going to be attacked anyway, let's make it significantly less, especially in the, in the place you want to feel safe and you want to maximize your own positivity and empowerment. Close the government your extension. Please don't waste time. Three, two, one. Exactly. I'm sorry. So on your side of the house, why why exactly there is a likelihood that any developing country universities are going to implement safetyism? Come on, this is scope. Okay. Obviously, this will be applied to universities that have the capacity to do this and they have the soft capital to do this. And I assume in developing countries, if opening government is correct, people that are more liberal and more educated are going to these universities, this applies as well. But even if not, the Western universities that have more capacity, all our cases applies, they're probably more important. Why slurs and stigma can actually amplify, people are, can be ignorant, pop culture in, incites you, you see Ricky Zervain, you think this is a cool thing. Third mechanism, I think there is a guilty pleasure to it. You feel the power you have over people at some point and you feel that you can actually use that. Fourthly, I think people say, see, see the, the victim to the, they put the burden on the victim and they say, you shouldn't be offended by this. You shouldn't be the one that you should be cope with your own existential crisis. All of this matters because we, we think that taking an official stance over it and saying, no, it is a burden on you to adjust on them. It's a matter of great significance for all the benefits that we have. A, I think then you have empowerment when it comes to people feeling safe, when it comes to exploring different stuff, to feel okay with the clothes they choose, to be able to explore different things, to not have regrets outside of university, to be able to focus on academic success and to be able to actually surpass this existential threat that is most likely to peak while you're you know, in university because it's the moment that you're an adult and you're exploring different stuff. I think all in all, hate speech is less. You report more. People feel safer. Really, really proud to be a no-o. Amazing. Uh, I thank the deputy leader of opposition for that fine speech. And now we're opening up the closing half with member of government. You're here. Okay. Uh, uh, for POIs, you can just like switch on your camera if that's okay, or put it in the chat. No audio. Everything is okay. Fine. I'll be starting in five, four, three, two. One, I would actually argue that safetyism is not being implemented across all universities. It is likely to be implemented in universities where there is institutional capital towards safetyism, which means a large liberal group of people, student unions, which are constantly supporting this ideology. Otherwise, if universities implement this and most of the students disagree with this, they would go on strikes. I don't think they would ever follow it. And the implementation becomes impossible. It is far more likely that this has been done in places where there are there is already a strong liberal forces, student unions are dom dominated by liberal individuals and they are trying to create safe spaces anyways. I have two impacts. For the first one, I need to do some framing. The framing is, this is likely to be used in a bad way. The first thing I would say is that these policies are likely to carry sanctions simply because they are far more likely to have groups which are likely to implement such sanctions. First, the liberal spaces in recent times have gone in a direction that have characterized inaccurate pronouns as hate speeches, or at least have actively asked for sanctions against people, even if they do not go to extremes such as calling it hate speeches, simply because only deterrents can change this behavior according to them. Second, the bias response teams constantly hears damage that has been done to the victims and is actively sensitive towards them. They are likely to want a reasonable punishment for the perpetrator simply because it creates appropriate deterrence and something that fits the harm that they have been able to do. Third, people who are likely to implement these policies are likely to be made up of only liberal individuals simply because they are likely to be the dominant force within such institutions, which means if, uh, even if they even if they uh, get a, like give a hearing to the perpetrator, this person who has committed the harm is far more likely to feel like he was hurt by extremely biased people and he would feel like the biased decisions have been made against him. It doesn't matter whether the decision is actually biased, simply the fact that the person feels like that. The 
first impact is the easiest harm or the easiest punishment that can be imposed on these people is probably asking them to apologize in public. The harsher harms that can be imposed is probably suspension of those individuals. Remember, in a lot of these inst instances, the individual responsible for those harms are either ignorant or they just believe in a certain thing very strongly. These are people who are likely to see these steps as public humiliation and are far more likely to be antagonized, leading to them being far more radical in the open society. Remember, they don't only live in the university for their entire life. University is only a small part. This means they are they are far more likely to be silent in the university, but they, they would double down on such harms uh, with a more radical approach in the society outside. This includes their time during the university where they are spending time outside, but also like after the university. I would assert, uh, I would assert to establish my second impact that this is far more likely to, likely to antagonize a lot of uh, conservatives. Simply because conservatives have, have, uh, like have placed some reliance on free speech. Free speech is a very reasonable demand according to them. At the point when uh, somebody creates safe spaces, they rather call it an woke space and find the uh, existence of these spaces to be extremely biased. It doesn't matter whether these are unbiased spaces or not. I actually think that safety mechanisms are amazing and they are totally good. However, it is likely to be portrayed by the conservative media and conservative leaders to be bad and something that restricts free speech free speech. Before I impact it, I would like to note that the two institutions I'm going to discuss do care about the unbiased status of the university within public perception, which means whether university is actually biased or not doesn't matter. The public, person, public perception is what matters the most. This is why my impacts become most important. Firstly, this influences government decision making. In a lot of instances, the governments themselves are conservative with conservative parties in power. But assume for a moment that they aren't conservative. They face huge backlash for supporting institutions which have a biased image within, uh, within like public. This is important because on opposition, the institutional policies themselves reflect a certain kind of bias in public perception towards certain groups of people. This is likely to going to put either huge pressure on such governments to shift such grants to universities, which are unbiased according to public perception whatsoever. Generally, this might lead to cut of grants and the cut of infrastructure that government is willing to provide and the support that government is willing to provide. But in a lot of instances where the governments are conservative, it can be a conservative state government, it can be a conservative national government. This probably means that they uh, go on campaigning again this university but also cut all the support that, that they are getting simply because they now have an excuse that they want to support unbiased institution and generally speaking these are uh, uh, universities where you can cut funding due to that particular reason the second institutions are corporations corporations these days are likely to be susceptible to huge call out mechanisms and boycott calls on social media Corporations are explicitly called out for supporting any institution which is taking a political stance. The supporter of that call out uh, particularly boycott the products coming from that particular institutions. For example, all liberals boycotted Twitter uh, when Elon Musk took over it and a lot of them left Twitter, it bring, bringing the revenue of Twitter quite down. This probably means that corporations do care a lot about the public perception uh, being uh, unbiased towards particular institution that they are supporting. Corporations currently donate huge sums of money and collaborate with universities in order to increase research in particular fields which would benefit them. This particularly leads to good research in university. I would impact it later, but these corporations are also likely to cut funding and the collaborations that they are doing with universities to a very large extent. Lastly, a lot of conservatives actually donate to universities to uh, like uh, to establish scholarships, infrastructure in terms of small donations. This is a very large group of people. Given they see this as a biased step, they are also likely to withdraw their funding. I'll take one from CG before I impact this. Closing off. Uh, this is just the oh. same mechanism as OG, but with a really mental impact. Students are still voters too. I'm unclear as to why you as a government are going to be like, ah, no more money for you, you woke liberals. Because the policy of that institution now clearly reflects that they are a liberal institution and there is huge public pressure to not do it. If that is true, then the impact is huge. Firstly, to a very large extent, this probably leads to uh, developing country universities if they are going to implement it, losing a lot of funding that they could have established in terms of scholarships. Remember, scholarships are established for individuals who have no resources, no social support structures. Probably liberal individuals have uh, like uh, established some support structures and fallback mechanisms for them, which means to an extent these are the people who are more vulnerable and they, ha they get harmed a lot. But within like a uh, general uh, developed country as well. This takes away scholarship, reading mechanisms, good libraries. 
probably like good uh, structures for example more gender neutral spaces and any infrastructural development that the uh, that the uh, like in institution could have done in future we have two impacts one is that people become far more radical and they inflict much more harms in the real society which harms all the stakeholders o and co is talking about and secondly it reduces the ability of universities to create good infrastructure for people in these cases given they are dominated by liberals there would be good infrastructure for liberal individuals only which is cut, which is cut out and scholarships are taken away very proud to propose thank you very much to the member of government for that fine speech welcoming the member of opposition here here can you hear me yeah Lovely. Um, POI is in the chat, preferably, uh, unless I'm completely forgetting to take one. And then you can unmute yourself if you so wish. Cool. A response to the impact that comes out of CG uh, and then responses to the mechanisms a little bit later, because I think they're already present in opening government, uh, and then some comments on why I think O is relatively limited. On CG, they say conservatives won't like this, which is the same thing OG say. And then they say, and what this means is the conservatives are no longer going to fund universities. I think the issue with this is, firstly, that university students is not a voting base. Secondly, like uh, governments already view universities as more liberal than the government anyway. So I'm unclear as to this is the comparative like change in this, uh, this that this motion creates. But thirdly, I also just think if you have a child, so if you're a middle-aged person with a child who is going to university, you also want those universities to have funding. I think it'd be an incredibly politically unpopular opinion to just reduce any form of funding to universities in the first place. This seems kind of mental. I think the second thing with corporations is I think corporations benefit hugely from investing in universities as a way in which they can access uh, access research. I think I'm unclear as well, again, this is the tipping point for them to necessarily disengage entirely. Um, I think with opening government, I think a lot of it is like, ah, conservatives won't like this and therefore they'll back out of going to university. Most people want access to an education. I think my desire to be educated and be able to access a large part of the workforce is significantly higher paid. It's probably going to overrule my fear of woke liberals. But I also think this policy is probably going to be enacted on both sides, because I think it probably happens in a way in which you are probably okay with conservatives too. For example, I think all of us probably know some gay conservatives, we know some conservatives who aren't part of the majority race within that country. I'm unclear as to whether this is specifically targeting right wing people as opposed to protecting people who also fall into those groups who exist in the right wing. But yeah, I think it's unlikely that people disengage entirely. However, I think the opening government have responses to opening opposition that opening opposition are never able to answer. They say, ah, uh, you're going to be faced with this when you enter the outside world. This is true. I'm unclear as to why opening opening opposition are able to teach the people the skills that they need from this form of university education. But secondly, I think that realistically, the issue with this then becomes I'm unclear as to like why the people they say ah this creates coping mechanisms allows people to come out to like the, come out and talk to the people that are there to support them. I think you just probably do just have friends for this. Maybe open opposition don't, but most people just have a connection of like a network that allows them to talk about these things without necessarily having to go to university institutions. But then just a note on framing because I think this is really important. I think that this probably only occurs where there is a desire for this policy to happen in the first place because we're opposing how it exists in the real world, not just every university suddenly doing this. I think realistically this probably doesn't happen where you are like already scared to be gay because your country is homophobic. So I'm unclear as to whether that would then enact a policy where they're protecting gay people. I think this is relatively unlikely. Meaning that I think this probably only occurs in the most absolute drastic circumstances. I think it probably does happen in relatively liberal companies, uh, countries. I think it probably happens when there is some threat of disruption at the way in which people are voicing their opinions in the first place. What does this mean? I think this means a few things. Firstly, I think that you only you engage it in a way which is likely because you probably want this to be politically palatable you engage it in a way that says we are also defending other other types of things that are particularly we're defending identity traits that everyone can experience but i also think you probably only implement this when you have a student body who is becoming specifically disruptive what this looks like is any form of protest it's when students are getting disruptive in class being uh, overly uh, disruptive when a lecturer is saying something that they don't like uh, you use this as a way in which you use this in a way in which you can manage to make that disruption significant less because I think the important thing to note here is that realistically the majority of education is focused on conversation most of us have to go to seminars and engage in seminars where you ask questions about specific political events or specific events that you can link back to politics in a way that means that people have to voice their opinions and I think the problem is that when you give students the opportunity to voice their opinions there are always going to be a few, a few students
students who exist on the most radical end of either spectrum who are going to have relatively different opinions to the rest of people. So this case is only contingent on a few people having very extreme opinions. And I think this is very likely to happen just because of the way in which politics works. But I think what this then means is that these students become specifically disruptive. They question teachers in a way that means that other people can't focus in class. They do things like organized protests that mean that you have less access to going into class in the first place. I think they create um, an environment that a lot of people fear. I think this necessarily means that it's like it becomes significantly worse for students who are trying to engage in this anyway. Before I move on, OG. How are impacts then, even if only free universities implement this and people who are opposing this policy will mock this, blow it out of the proportion and present like this is happening everywhere because people will be too lazy to check? Could you please engage with that mechanism? I think that that's relatively unlikely to be the case because I firstly, I didn't know this policy was a thing in the first place, meaning that if it had been implemented in some universities and considering we're opposing it in the real world, I'm unclear to where they're, where they're saying this in the first place. But secondly, I think it's only really like really right wing nut jobs who are probably saying that. And I think this means that you probably just go to a university that you perceive to be a more right-wing university. I'm unclear as to why this is a big harm in this debate. So I think what we are able to do is we are able to limit the amount of disruption that happens within university campuses. Why is this the case? I think it's because, firstly, in the status quo, there are very few mechanisms by which you can uh, deal with this deal with disruptive students. And I think specifically as a professor or as a student, I think you feel that like you have very little recourse against the things that you feel to be problematic within the within the status quo. I think just providing an additional mechanism that people can use to either be critical of the establishment in a way that means that they feel heard, means that they aren't resorting to more violent forms of being heard, which I think is probably a good thing. But I also think it just means that professors are more able to you're because this is not, not getting rid of political opinion. I think you're more able to have a diversity of opinions that exist within a class, but have a cutoff point that means you're able to still manage that class in a way that is productive for the majority of people. Um, I think this is just has a huge impact. So I think it impacts the majority of people. I want to know the majority of people don't face any form of hate crime. Like, um, uh, like obviously, like women face sexism every day, but like most of that sex is business sexism that makes me like have to go out and do something about it. Most of it is just very like surface level. And I think this uh, this doesn't change any of that. So the majority of students don't ever face things that will ever go to these biased courts in the first place, meaning that I think the majority of people are just at university to try and learn things, try and engage in like university and be able to like learn the things that the professors are telling them. I think the reason this is important is that when you have incredibly disruptive students, it becomes harder as a student to engage in that process in the first place, meaning that you're less able less able to like engage in university. This is the most important thing. These are the most important people and these are also the majority of people. So on scale, we win. I think the second thing to note then as well is that on funding, I, I actually just think that corporations are already aware of the political leanings of these universities, but also corporations exist across a, a variety of political spectrums. I think you also have left-wing corporations, left-wing NGOs, uh, left-wing things that also require research. So I'm unclear as to why the research gets comparatively less. But secondly, I also think the thing that reduces research or reduces funding probably isn't your what you believe the political leaning of a university to be, given that this political leaning is probably just going to be, we're trying to moderate this as opposed to allowing it to enter either end of the extremes. I think realistically, the thing that means you increase your funding is if you believe that that university is a stable place in which to stable place to fund i.e if there are loads of student pro uh, protests and loads of people who aren't engaging in university as we're seeing at the moment across america i think mean, you're less late likely to give that university funding in the first place mainly because Firstly, like you're, you're aware that there's a lack of stability, which means it's less predictable, which means that the investment is less certain. But secondly, just because you don't want to be attached to something that is being so volatile and exists in, like, within the like, public sphere of knowledge or whatever. I think for all of these reasons, very proud to oppose. Thank you very, very much, member of gov uh, sorry, member of opposition for that fine speech. Um, government Whip, you have the floor. You're here. All right. I'll take POIs via the chat. Don't vocalize. I'll ask you one from opening opposition. So just keep on at me. Starting my speech in three, two, one. Op bench is out of this debate because they don't have a case. Firstly, because they don't have a causation of why this thing is exceptionally required. OO says that this is required to educate people, but seminars and workshops already exist. So I'm unclear as to why educational purposes are really fulfilled by these bias groups and what extent to which these people can actually educate these individuals. One, because most students are already part of the internet. That means they're already like exposed to woke culture and probably like progressivism. That means either they've actively denied to be a part of it or they just are getting more and more acquainted to it. So I just don't really realize what the extent of this education is from opening opposition. And then the similar mechanism that CO sort of builds on is the idea that you want to 
you aren't as proximate or you don't have any actual abilities to criticize these individuals. This is functionally false because universities are exceptionally critical of individuals who are extremely disruptive. This means that you can be expelled by academic, like the university rules. If you go forward and like stop classes or are rude to teachers or are actively like mentally harassing like fellow students. But if what they're saying is true, I have a couple of reasonings and a couple of framings that I want you to believe. First off, who are these people who are likely to be parts of these groups? Why are they going to be exceptionally critical of anyone from uh, an ideology who's not their own? First off, what does the liberal mindset in extremism situ situations like this look like? They function in absolute fear of harm on any particular individuals within their community. That means all micro instances in which any form of aggression is sown, they believe this to be an, an, an impetus towards a larger movement or something that can further harm them in a much larger scale. So they preemptively go forward and double down on these scenarios and go forward and take stricter measures than are required to actually a, educate these people, but also go forward and criticize them in a much worse Worst manner that you can believe. This looks like social sanctions on these individuals, which already exist, by the way. But the problem is that this is authorized by the university for you to go forward and do this and blacklist this individual in terms of posters and in terms of making people believe that this person is an active harm to society. This is done in worse ways because the like the like passive fear that these people already have. But also, how do these people function? The mentality amongst all liberal groups and most liberal societies right now is that someone being a right winger inherently is bad. Someone being overtly religious inherently is bad. That means the word itself of being religious or someone being right winger, as was used throughout this debate, was something that's seen as a negative trait of an individual. That means you go forward and specifically patrol against individuals or groups or communities that are for this particular group or for this particular identity. This is different from what OG has said, because notice OG just said that, oh, conservative people are harmed. But if you're to believe what opposition is already saying, it's probably something that's just being done to educate them. So I'm unsure what the harm on OG is because they just say that, oh, people are probably not leaning into progressivism. But what opening opposition and CO say is that you probably want these people to be more tolerant. So at, at a point of time, I'm unsure to what this acceptance on making these people be more tolerant on OO is, and CO is yet to give that mechanism. I'm unsure what happens on their side, but it still beats OG because OG is averse to the idea of people just being more tolerant towards other communities and groups, which I believe can just be another social re like responsibility of a university to create safe spaces for them. But what's not okay for these people is the active like extremism that's followed. And this directly clashes with CO because they say that extremism won't be the part of this group. Why is extremism the most likely form? First, the people who are the most vocal and the most extreme within these groups are likely to be voted to the heads or the committees that are deciding what is wrong and what is right within these groups. That means it's most likely that these people are deciding what is right and what's wrong. And given that they're extreme, and like, why is it just likely to be them so that like op whip doesn't go crazy on me? The time and will to actually actualize and like work on these things is the most with these people. Secondly, social groups automatically default to people who are the most extreme or the loudest people who are like functioning for something. That means they're the most likely to get voted to the top. Thirdly, if campaigning happens, these are the most likely people to get voted to the top once again. That means for sure, the people who are heading these institutions are likely to be extreme individuals who go for and take extreme measures regardless. Why is this bad? Firstly, in terms of the universe. I've explained to you why this is bad for students actually being impacted because they're likely to be faced with some sort of antagonization regardless. But why do like pre-existing measures against this exist? First off, as students, you can go forward and report to places of institution or any place of profession where this individual who was being bad to you was involved or is employed right now and report these things to them where corporations are increasingly sensitive towards things like people being rude or people being bad. You have active measures to go against and take against these people. You can informally blacklist this individual amongst your own communities and move away from this person because you know that this person is someone that's harmful, but also informally talk within the campus spaces and inform people that this is, this is a person like this. But the problem here is in this motion that this is, a, this is a sanction. This group is sanctioned by the university to have this power. The problem here exists is that one, there's an active step taken by the university to make this sanction of what is right and what's wrong. That means this university is actively taking a stance on what they believe is to be correct and what's wrong. And this is the strewing that act, the, the, the skewing that Anshuman talks to you about on why this directly impacts universities. One, you're directly creating an asymmetry in the power that each student has. That means within cohorts, you fear judgment and you fear the actual possibility of these people taking action 
aggressions against you. That means a lot of the microaggressions that happen, and there's a tipping point. Because notice, OG never tells you, because if most liberal societies already exist within university spaces, these sort of aggressions and these sort of uh, like interactions already happen. The tipping point is when the university actively goes forward and says that, yes, this is something that's right to do. That means you believe that you have no power operationally and functionally to actually go against these people. But before I continue, oh. Siji wants students to run and hide. Why extremists are better off without this paper? Oh, come What's on. You really want to run the idea that people are actively hiding and run away in, running away in these scenarios, where it's possibly not true. Either this is functioning in a liberal society where people are getting voted to actually do this, or this is a hyper-conservative place where people are never opting into these groups to actually like police other people. You can't opt into both, like, both frames and like try to debate them. That's why you're out. But also... Why is this tipping point something that's crucial? Notice, this is the form of aggression that people use in revenge outside of university spaces and go forward and actualize real life and real term like positions and powers that they get later on to remember the fact that, oh, in my university time, I was hunted down by these individuals and made to feel like shit, but now I can go forward and create some actual harm against them because if we actually break out of the university bubble, university doesn't really matter, honestly, because it doesn't really do much or give you much power, but in the real world, you do. But why is money the most important thing as well because notice government grants and religious institutions that give money fund scholarships for people who are poor and vulnerable to get into college and probably get educated but also research on ideas like where vulnerable people are bad and vulnerable communities like social research like are poor people just poor because they're lazy and this is broken down by systemic research this is exceptionally important because this changes the educational and like the popular discourse that's happening scientifically as well and challenges the popular myths and beliefs that exist in society against these people. Thank you, Government Whip, for the fine speech. Now welcoming the last speaker of this debate, Opposition Whip, you're here. Um, okay, before I begin, PY is exclusively in the chat, please. Can you not be eating that hard, <laughs> please? <laughs> Nightmare. Okay, firstly, I want to do a few responses to the incentives that we get from closing government for universities to do the most extreme uh, parts of these measures. The only mechanism that they provide for this is that, ah, well, the people who are likely to control the policies are likely to be the most woke, the people at the top who uh, heads of this committee that enforces policy. Two reasons as to why these, the policy is likely to be more moderate, like you're not going to actively humiliate people, etc. I think, firstly, universities have a uh, financial incentive not to do this, because notably, these individuals who are maybe doing these extreme actions are also paying into like uh, like the university funds, i.e. they're paying their tuition fees, um, etc. Which means that you don't necessarily want to piss off the students enough or like expel them from your university, because then that's one person who's putting money into the pot that would have meant you, you as a university could do extra could get extra resources you could do extra um like uh, extra modules things like that i think this means that there's a negative financial incentive for you to want to do this but secondarily even if this is true I think that the heads of the committee are only the people that are enacting the policy, not the people who are actually bringing the cases forward. I.e., if you're a professor and you know your student is likely to face the most harsh version of this policy, I think the, the point at which you have the power to raise if someone has done this violation in the first place, I think you're unlikely to be able to back the most extreme ex uh, punishments that are pushed. This means the committee has an incentive not to make the punishment so high because the professors would never call, would never call them out in the first place, never catch anyone, which would make the policy ineffective. This means that I think in the vast majority of these contexts, people are held to account, but it's not the worst things that, that closing government talk about, which I think wipes out most of their case because they're contingent upon people being humiliated in such a way that it brings all the negative consequences, that there's negative backlash as a consequence of this. I don't think they actually reach the tipping point to prove this as such. Unfortunately, they're out of this debate. What does Alex actually prove to you in this debate then? I think Alex explains to you specifically how the, uh, the uh, this policy allows ind individual people who are running a lot of the discourse that, ex that is dependent upon for education to, to function, to hold individuals that are, are, are disruptive to account. So I people who are using ag aggressive language, people who are using the sorts of language that would uh, uh, upset other individuals. I think this just gives you as a professor easier uh, easier recourse to which you can hold these individuals to account, i.e. you can say, ah, no, you probably shouldn't be doing this, etc. 
I think this just means in the instances, it's a lot easier for, for, for professors to cut down the discussion when it is becoming so, so toxic. In the universities that is likely to happen, I think this is probably universities where this policy is implemented, the people where the discourse is so, so toxic that it disrupts lots of elements of student life. I.e., you go into your seminar and someone just has an argument with the professor over if something is appropriate or uh, appropriate or not to say. I think the majority of individuals who, who, are, doing the, who are doing this just want to learn. I, they just want to learn the, the information that's going to get them to pass their test, it's likely to get them to get a higher mark on their essay. That is likely to fulfill the inspiration to why they're doing that course in the first place. I, if I'm a history student, I'm really interested in learning history, not listening to someone argue with my professor from the majority of, uh, of, the, um, of, the, of the seminar. I think this means that this leads to two impacts. I think that one is just that the quality of the education gets way, way worse, which means you're less likely to be successful off of the basis of you being in that program i.e you're less likely to be able to like you know get as high as high marks which means you are less able to get the highest level of employment as a student at the point which you have other people relatively out competing you regardless i think this means then that like in a lot of these circumstances you're not getting as much return for the investment that you otherwise would have done i.e this might be the difference between you getting a 58 and a 62. this can be a huge difference in the development of your career at the point which the only thing that distinguishes you as a student is how well your qualification was the second one is if it just becomes so bad that you cannot intake the information uh, to a good enough degree and you feel like you're un unlikely to be able Form. I think this is the tipping point early on within your education to which you just have burnout, i.e. that you're not getting the quality of the education that you thought you would have done. So what is the fucking point? I think this means that a lot of students never actually engage with their education. They drop out earlier or they just don't attend the seminars because they've become so toxic. I think this lowers the quality for, ed for education for students in general. These individuals are probably the majority of individuals because notably they just want to prior prioritize the main reason why you go to university, which is to gain economic benefit. I you want to go and get the, uh, the qualification it's likely to benefit you in your career further along the line. This means we beat opening government because they are reliant upon one radical group of individuals where they concede a radical people who haven't learned under this system as being particularly vulnerable. I'd say that these individuals aren't any more vulnerable than the people who, uh, who, who uh, like need the education as well. I think everyone pays the same level of tuition fees. So they should all have equal access to that education. Other individuals shouldn't just be prioritized because they didn't learn to, to be sensible enough when they were younger. I think there's no distinguishing factor towards these individuals which means they should be prioritized over other students within discussion. I think this means that in the majority of cases, we should prioritize the majority of students who want to get this return on their investment, even open government's best case scenario where some of these people are deprioritized. Some of these people um, aren't able to engage as well as they as they otherwise could have done. I think we get better outcomes for the more people under our comparative, which means that we already beat them on scale because more people are able to gain access to that quality education. But notably, I think they do have alternatives under opening government's frame. I like if you're 18 years old, you probably are able to engage with some amount of discourse. I think you have other re other routes to which you can probably become a sensible student. You've had lots of opportunities to engage in a good faith way, and you've still chosen to go down this path of being disrupted. I think at that point you've had your chance, right? Why should these people be given the, the opportunity that they deserve over anyone else? But notably, if all else fails, you have alternatives, right? There is a different scale to which controversy happens in universities, different political biases that exist in different in different uh, societies. If you care about this so much as a student, you're being locked out of this, you go to the institution that represents you and your opinions more. So you do have access under open governance frame. Before I continue, I'll take OG. If your policy is soft, soft, as you claim, that gives zero feeling of safety or deterrence, because it will be just like, please don't no. do this again. We want to educate you. What no, kind Cloud, of Cloud, 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 you as a professor have an incentive for your, for your seminar to not be derailed. So there has to be some amount of punishment to which a student is likely to do this. So it's probably a punishment that is like, you know, ah, you get a, you get a telling off or you get a suspension from a seminar or whatever. It doesn't mean you never engage in that education system again. You are contingent on proving the most extreme examples of, humili of humiliation. And unfortunately, you've never proved that incentive. So therefore, opening government is out of this debate. Cool. Going into OO then, why do we be over OO? I think just intuitively, uh, one second, I'll on the piece, but there it is. I think intuitively, like, Opening opposition have an issue where they are speculative upon the incentives of individuals changing in a way that's likely to benefit them. I, oh, if this felt X more safe, I would go and engage. I think there's lots of other counter narratives as to why people wouldn't do this. I think we are less de dependent upon the incentives of individuals actually changing, just that individuals just get held to account and other people who would already have engaged do engage. I think this means that we have less steps to prove that we have more engagement. We have a higher scale, a scale of individuals that are more benefited as well at the point at which there's probably just more people to experience that don't experience these things than do. Therefore, we win. Thank you. Thank you, opposition.
Edition Whip and all the speakers for a great round. Um, yeah, good luck, guys. Please exit this room. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys, for the round.